Recording live from the Northeast Georgia Business Radio X Studio. This is Northeast Georgia Business Radio presented by Regions Bank. Embrace the FN life. Member FDIC, an equal housing lender. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back to another exciting edition of Northeast Georgia Business Radio. I'm your host, Tom Sheldon. And yeah, we're coming to you live from the beautiful Empower College and Career Center of Jackson County. I have with me yet another great guest, really cool guy from Marsh Creek Advisors. I have with me Carl Nickpon. Carl, welcome to the Northeast Studio. Tom, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. How are you, brother? Excellent. It stopped raining right when you got here. Thank goodness, too. I wish you'd have come like two hours earlier when I got here. Maybe you just stopped the rain somehow. Did you come in a rowboat? I came across the parking lot yeah. in a rowboat. Yeah. Yeah, man. Carl Nickpon, Marsh Creek Advisors. You're a managing director. What does Marsh Creek do? Yeah, so Marsh Creek Advisors is a sell-side M&A firm. What that really means in plain and simple English is we help business owners sell their business when it's time when the time comes. What lower middle market, middle market businesses? Yeah, that's a that's a that's, that's a, a fancy term. That's a fancy term. It is. What it really means is that we help business owners who have got at least a net income of five hundred thousand dollars or more aren't quite big enough to be looking at an IPO or anything like that. So right, right. we're right in the middle between those big investment banks, the franchise kind of transactions where it's an individual buyer and an individual seller. Those uh, would, would tend to be a business broker. We sit right between the business brokers and the investment bankers. You're a match. It's all of that. I, yes. And typically our buyers, that's what probably makes the biggest difference is that our buyers are going to be mostly private equity, family offices, and strategic buyers, as opposed to an individual buyer. That's kind of the, the difference between a business broker. Working and with it. investors? Working well, we don't work directly with the investors. Okay. It might be helpful too a little bit to kind of describe how how it works when private equity puts a fund together. So a private equity firm will go out to wealthy investors, collect their money, right, with the intention, with a specific intention. We are right. going to go and buy and grow companies in this particular industry. Mm-hmm. A business plan, yeah, yeah. That's their. Yeah. That's right. Okay. And they make it out of buying and, and eventually selling companies. Right. They have a, a duty to their investors that a time frame. And so sometimes the fund is seven years, sometimes it's 10 years, but however long it is, they have to make the acquisitions and then grow those companies and then sell those companies to the next owner in order to be able to turn back to the investors their money with a profit. So there's a schedule. That's right. They're on a clock. They're on a clock. It might be years, but they're on a clock. That's right. I'm with you. That's kind of where you slide in, I guess. So we help them in finding businesses, but we really only do that by representing sellers. And part of the reason we want there to be no question that when we represent a seller, we're hand in hand with you. Our success is tied to yours, and there's nothing but what's in it for you on our minds. You're pro seller. That's it. Now, how did you get into this, though? You've had some experience. You definitely have business experience. A little bit. But about selling a business or businesses. It was third generation in my family business. Started a family business. Started working there when I was five years old. That's what I was trying to get out of you. Cleaning shoes. We were in the wedding and event and prom industry. So we mostly did tuxedos, suits, bridal gowns, bridesmaids for weddings and for proms. Gotcha. You were the outfitter. We were. And I tried to get away from the family business. Good luck with that. Yeah. Uh-huh. But it was actually a really good thing. One, because I met my wife while I was away doing nice. that. And two, because I really developed an appreciation for business and what it makes available for people, mm-hmm. especially for the owners. Well, you were born and raised in it. I was. Yeah, man. I was. I can understand that. But, you know, I was determined to go out and do my own thing. And, and you do know, it better. That's right. The family business was kind of... Like the Death Star. It just had a tractor beam and it just kept drawing me back back in. in. That's it. Every time. Every time. And I'm really grateful that it did. One, because it was an honor to work with my mother and my uncle. Yeah. And my cousin. Two, because I got to do things that I never would have gotten to do had I not had that opportunity. And being away from the family business for a time also gave me credibility when I came back in. And it wasn't like, you know, the prince walking back, you know, walking in. Being the boss's kid is not always a good thing. Been there, done that. It's a tough spot. It can be. I can see that being away for a while. Yeah. And then coming back. What did you dabble in 
during your ways away? During my time away, well, I met my wife. And awesome. we met in at the University of Chicago doing clinical social work degrees. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I was in education, student services provider and then administrator in K-12 education. Discovered after a little bit of time that there was not enough creativity allowed in a school system yeah. for someone with an entrepreneurial mind. No. And I, having I been raised in a business, I grew up. That's what you knew. That's what I knew. It really was. So when I talked to the family and heard about some of the challenges that they were having and immediately started thinking, well, we could do something about that. It just seemed like the time to come home. So you asked me, how did that turn into selling the business? Well, yeah, yeah. it's kind of funny. I asked a friend of mine who has very good practice as an attorney in investment banks, big, big, big transactions between businesses. And I knew that we weren't going to use him because his specialty was big, huge big, money. Big deals. And that wasn't us. But I asked him, I said, you know this space, who should we go see? And he gave me a name. So I brought the family and we all went to see, see this person. And we couldn't put our finger on it, but when we walked out, we knew it wasn't the right fit. That gut feeling, man. Yep. Like a lot of business owners, we kind of just trust our gut. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We weren't quite ready to do a transaction then. We, we need a little bit of time and, you know, we kind of worked on some things. And then when we decided it was time, I kind of thought about that experience and I made a mistake. And the mistake I made was that I, I assumed that if he was the best there was in this business, mm -hmm. that they were, that there was none better. It was recommended by somebody I really right. thought highly of. Right. I went about selling the business without a broker, oh. without an M&A advisor. Right. We used our attorney and we used our CPA. Uh -huh. And then I ran the transaction. Right. I was grateful that we came out unscathed. Nice. But I do think that we probably could have done better. Yeah. Uh, knowing what I know now. Of course. Hindsight. Um, so that's right. Hindsight is so 2020. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why I, I do what I do now is because I've learned so much and I really want people to do even better than we did. I want them, I want business owners to get the most for their life's work. And I think a little bit about business owners, we tend to go into owning a business for freedom. Like you don't, oh, yeah. don't want to have to mm -hmm. report to anybody. You don't want to have to, you, you want to be able to call your shots. Who am yeah. I going to work with? Who am I going to work for? Yeah, if you have the desire and the discipline, which that's sometimes where people fall down. It takes a lot. It can. And it, it can easily, if you do it right, it easily consumes you. So, you know, people go into it for freedom to be able yeah, to absolutely. You know, decide how this is going to look and, mm -hmm. and change things when they think there needs to be a change and not have to go through red tape to do it. And then the second part of freedom is when you don't have to worry about making payroll anymore. That's true. When you can say that to yourself, true. okay, what does a work optional life look like for me? <laughs> They are nice, I must say. Yeah. Yeah, they really are. So I want other people to be able to achieve that kind of freedom. So you're setting up exit strategies, more or less. That's right. What's the time frame on that? And that's not a fair question. No, but it's it's a great question because... Uh, I want to sell... Nick, I want to sell my business next month. Not going to happen, probably. Probably not, yeah. From the moment that a business owner says, I'm ready to, to do this... Start thinking about it, yeah. Yeah, no, beyond thinking about it, like... Let's go. Let's really do it. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. From that moment, it's nine to 12 months. About a year. Now, here's the thing. You got to remember that after that happens, yeah. the new owner isn't going to let you just waltz out the door oh, no. and no. wave, see you later. You're going to have to help through a transition. Yeah. And that is so important. It is. For everyone's sanity. Yes. It is. So a couple things. First of all, the typical transaction, uh, so the typical transition is at least six months, but normally more like 12. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's first thing to remember. So that means that we're at least two years away from work optional, right? right. From the time you say, right. say go. And then because most of these transactions, the business owner is going to have to leave. There's some structure in the deal. They don't get 100% of the transaction in cash, right? So they're going to either have to do a seller note right. uh, or an earn out, something like that, right? And you want to make sure that that business that you leave behind is doing well because you want to finish getting paid. Yeah, you want your money. You don't want the business back. That's right. Or worse, what's left of a business back. No, I'm with you on that. So that's at least two years. Now, okay. here's where it gets tricky. There's so much that you can do to make a business 
really attractive for sale. Okay. Much of that doesn't happen overnight. Plan in place. So right. if you think a little bit about, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of commonality to selling a house, right? In terms of how you price it and how you know what it's worth and what makes it attractive, all those kinds of things. And my wife and I were going to move and we saw it coming. We were going to buy my mom's house when, so my dad passed away when I was a teenager. So when I keep talking about my mom, my dad designed the house. When she retired, she was going to move. We knew this was coming and we were like, all right, we're going to buy that house because we want to keep it in the family. Absolutely. So we're living in our own in our own home at the time, and we knew that we were going to do some remodeling before we put it on the market because we could get a better price for it and nice return on our investment for mm-hmm. you know sprucing things up a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. So we did that work, and we lived in the house for less than a year before we put it on the market after the work was done. After the work. And we looked at it and we were like, God, this is amazing. Why didn't we do this sooner? <laughs> yeah, we, I, I can see that. It had been really fun to live in this house for the last five, seven years. And that is a little bit like you know, what we'd say about a business. A business that is attractive to sell is also really fun to run. So it's really great if you just start a little bit earlier because then you can enjoy mm-hmm. the fruits of your labor of sprucing it up while you're running it and before you bring it to market. I guess those are keys to success, maybe something yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, that's are you, f- you going to share, or is that going to be a deep dark secret? I don't. I don't blame <laughs> you if it is. No, no, we don't do secrets. Uh, <laughs> Good. I, I, Good. I, I, okay, hold on. I lied. We do one uh, big see, secret. He's got a secret. I do. I got a secret. I'll tell you, but I'll tell you what the secret is. Oh boy, the secret is confidentiality. When we represent oh, a business, course. yeah, we keep it secret. Yeah, and and do you even name more or less the company or the owners? Not when we're doing our initial marketing. It's company X, basically. That's right. And yeah. and we won't disclose that until we have an NDA in place from the prospective buyer mm-hmm. and the seller has looked at that buyer and said, yes, I'd be willing to, They're good to talk further with them. I got you. That's right. I think that's super important, man. Exactly. Oh, yeah. We got to make sure that they're protected because it's yeah. just, you know, if it's a year-long process, you don't want all of a sudden word to get out before... You've done the transaction. That can upset the apple cart. A little bit. Oh, so, yeah. so back to your keys to sorry, success sorry. question. No, that's yes. all right. This is good. The first one you kind of just you know, hit on. It's time. It takes time. We'll come back to that because it's kind of the first and the last. Gotcha. Let's talk about team. You can't do this on your own. If you think about selling your business and you're in the lower middle market, then you're going to be selling it to, like I said, private equity. You're going to be selling it to private family office, or you're going to be selling it to a strategic buyer. All those folks do transactions on a regular basis. That's their business. That's their business. They are right. good at it. Yeah. They're trained and yeah, veterans. So what we have here is a David versus Goliath situation. You really do. And that's not fair. No. So we're here to even the playing field. Right. We do that by building a team around you. We don't say that as as a M&A advisor, we know everything. We know where the pieces of the puzzle need to come together and mm-hmm. we can coordinate that. And we can tell you, all right, given what we're dealing with right now, we need to go bring in a special a tax advisor. We need to get a wealth advisor. We need a CPA who can handle this. We need to do a quality of earnings. Whatever it is that we need to do, we can go and coordinate those professionals and get a great team around you. And we can make sure that their communication, right, is seamless. That's important. Because you got to run your business in oh, the middle of all this uh, happening. Oh, by the you way, got yeah. customers calling and, you know, yeah. employees to deal with. So you can't take your eye off the ball. Right. And we'll do that part for you to make your life easier. So that's the first one is building a really good team. The second key to success, I'd say, is really trust. You have to be able to trust the people that you work with. You have to be able yeah. to trust that they've got your back. Yeah. That they're going to be there for you. I Most of the folks who do what I do were accountants by training. And probably most of them are much smarter than I am. The thing depends is, depends on the field, my friend. What 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 maybe makes us a little bit different is that I've actually been through. You've you've been in the trenches. That's right. You've got dirty. It is an emotional roller coaster to sell your business. Oh, it is. And it's one thing to be the kid at Six Flags who's on the platform waving by as the train rolls out and saying, "Enjoy your ride," mm-hmm. right? Oh yeah. And it's another thing to be, "Hey, I just got off this ride. I know what it's like," and your ride's going to be a little bit different than mine, mm-hmm. but I'm going to be able to walk with you through it. Being able to trust that they understand is, I think, important. The third one I'd say is transparency. Like I said, we don't have secrets. We'll, we'll tell you the way it is. That's a, that's a two-way street. There's so much we do behind the scenes. 
you probably don't want to hear about most of it because you got your business to run. But we'll give you a dashboard so you can see about all of our activities and you know what we're working on. And so there's yeah. that the sort of transparency. Here's the other part of that. You don't want to send your advisor to a negotiating table where they get hit with any surprises. I was about to say, surprises will kill you. Absolutely. Yeah. Buyers hate surprises. Everybody hates the same exact. Yeah. Yeah. The, the same exact detail, if we know it up front, we can disclose on our terms and we can manage the conversation around. When you pull that out, it's going to get discovered in, in due diligence. A friend of mine says that due diligence is like the colonoscopy without the drugs. So, oh, it can be. Um, we like to I make sure without drugs, but that we get out as much on the table before we go into that stage. Once we go into due diligence leverage flips from the buyer to the seller because during due diligence the buyer gives the the seller so i said that backwards after due diligence let's try that again after due diligence <laughs> starts right. leverage flips from the seller to the buyer to the buyer right that's right so the buyer's now got the upper hand mm -hmm. why because the buyer has an exclusivity period where the seller can't talk to other buyers you know during that time they're going to really look under the hood. Oh, yeah. And if it's there, they'll find it. Yeah. Well, they're going to press you. It's just general nature of business. That's right. Yeah. Because they are acting on the behalf of all their investors, mm -hmm. and they have a fiduciary duty not to buy something that has a lot of risk. Don't buy junk. Right. Bottom line is you want to be straight with your advisors up front and tell them the good, bad, and the ugly. And then that really brings us back to time because the first, the team, the trust, and the transparency all take time to build. So that, that means start early and have a lot of patience. Any pearls of wisdom you have for someone who's, who's thinking about this, who's gotten to that point? I bet you have tons of pearls of wisdom. Well, one of the things that I, I wish I would have known about, Yeah. in fact, I think it's probably the best kept secret, not intentionally so, but because this is not a conversation that mis most business owners are aware of. That is what I like to call the second bite at the apple strategy. Most people assume that I have two choices. I'm either going to run my business and own it, or I'm going to sell my business and someone else is going to run it and own it. There's actually this really beautiful middle of the road. So picture this. You've been running your business. You've been you know, successful in growing it. Yeah. You have some nice trends. You have a, a profitable, healthy business. And if you were to sell that business, let's just round numbers, say that you could sell that business for $5 million okay. today. Or you could sell half of your business for $2.5 million today. Bring on an equity partner who also has a lot of expertise and resources and contacts to help you run that business and grow it on steroids. Makes sense if it can be done. Now, remember, those private equity firms, they've got time-limited yeah. engagements, so they're going to want to look for their exit in five years or something like that. Mm -hmm. Five years from now, you're going to have another exit. They didn't just do this for the fun of it. They're doing this for a real nice upside. Oh, yeah, for everybody, so, hopefully. So we're going to take what was a $5 million business, and in five years, through your partnership with that, with that equity partner, you're going to turn that into a 25 or a $35 million business. Yeah. And you're going to have a second exit now that's even much larger than the first. Your first one was $2.5 million five, five years later. You have less stress running it because you have more support. You're not the only one worrying about payroll and all that other stuff. Right. Human resources. Yay. And yet, yeah, yay. Yay. And uh, five years later, you know, maybe it's twelve and a half million dollars that you now realize as a as a second bite at the apple. So you line all that up. So we line up the first transaction. We line up the beginning of that relationship, and then we get out of the way because we are not experts at at running the business. That's it's, your that, that's, that's what's your specific at. business, right? And people, I think one of the things is that people think that you know, business owners are a little bit shy about private equity because there have been some bad stories have there yes but they are few and far between when you look at the the whole scope of transactions that happen they're in this to make money too yeah so when y'all get together the the seller who's now the part owner and typically operator with support from that equity partner magical things can happen we're gonna keep in touch with you and make sure that you're doing well, but you have a new partnership and you want to be hand in hand in that and have gotcha. your focus there. Carl, that is a lot of great information, brother. Probably a little bit too much. So it is, I'm overloading over here. 
but it's it's a lot of information that so many business owners just don't know. And we're lucky, honestly, we're lucky to have you. I'm, we're I'm here to serious. break it down. So yeah. I will say, reach out to me, ask me questions, yeah, hit me up because um, I'm an educator at heart. I want business owners to make the most of their life's work. Most business owners will do this only once. Yeah. You, so let's make it great. You become a, just in general, a valuable resource. Yeah. You really do. How does all this start? Someone comes to you, they're ready. But how does all this begin? Yeah. So I, I'm actually going to say, I would even encourage them to come to us when they're not ready. I'll Be tell you. Beforehand. Yeah, because it starts with evaluation. Now, we'll do evaluation for free. If your company is making at least about hundred, uh, about 500000 or so Good in, million, in yeah. that income, right? Yeah. That's enough for us to use our resources to get good comps right. that are going to give us a very right. good sense of what a transaction for your type of company, your size, all that. The industry, yeah. Could look like. Right. And I think that most business owners, well, the stats tell us that 80% of the business owner's wealth is tied up in their business. Oh, yeah. And I think I, I didn't know how much my business was worth when I was running it. And that was, but yet if I would have gone to my, my financial advisor and asked about my portfolio and, and he'd have said, uh, let me get back to you on that. I'm not quite sure. Right. I'd be like, never mind. Let me just take this to somebody else. <laughs> exactly. But yeah. we tolerate that with ourselves as business owners. It's okay. We, we do. We do. And um, so the first thing I'd say is just know, just know where you're at and like I said, we'll do that. We'll walk with you year by year, updating it. No charge. Why? So we can develop a relationship with of you. Of course, yeah. Help you understand uh, and and help you understand what parts of your business buyers will find attractive. That's important. And what parts of your business buyers will find risky. Maybe things you can work on. And whenever you yeah. hear risk, that means lower price. Exactly. So you're exactly right. Things you can work on. Now, we're not going to be the ones to come in and, and give you consulting for how to change those things in your organization, how to add new aspects. We're not going to do that part. We'll be happy to recommend some folks that are very good at it. That, going back to that team. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But it all starts with knowing the value of your business and understanding what parts of it are generating that value and what parts are maybe creating a little bit of a headwind. You got a website? mcreek.com. That's easy. Yep. Letter M, Creek. Dot com Marsh yeah. Creek Advisors Marsh Creek Advisors and you can find me on LinkedIn if you if you like LinkedIn Carl Nickpon N I C P O N that is a very unique name I think it's a cool name thanks I'm dead serious I'm vamping a little bit they're playing my music Nick thank you so much Nick Carl thank you so much for coming in happens all the time I oh it. Carl Nickpon ladies and gentlemen the guy grew up in a family business sold it learned a lot now he's helping everybody do do the same thing. Pretty darn cool if you ask me. mcreek.com. I'm Tom Sheldon. Talk to you soon. Life is full of ifs. But if you want to cash flow like a pro and get paid up to two days early, safeguard against surprises and supercharge your savings, Regions Life Banking makes it possible. Regions Bank embrace the if in life. Regions Bank, member FDIC.